And what is going on, everybody? This is Josh Wilson, and this is the Big Dog Podcast here with the tech guy, Jonathan J. Mack. What up? What up? What's going on? You good? Yeah, I'm hanging out. Nice. That's cool. That's cool. So we're just chatting. Um, you know, we were talking about UVA putting a whooping on the tribe. Yep. William and Mary. Is that their is that their deal now? Is, are they still the tribe? William yeah, I think tribe? it's William and Mary tribe. I don't know if they're gonna go the route of the Cleveland Indians and change the name. Yeah, because it was their mascot they changed. It wasn't oh, their name, right? Okay. They've always been the tribe. Yeah. But now they have this weird bird. Really? Yeah. I did not that know runs that. around. I used to go to William and Mary basketball games okay. all the time, but I haven't been back to gotcha. like a football event in a while. Yeah, pre pre vid. Uh, we went to, we went up there to a basketball game. It was a good time. It was fun. Yeah. Um, they have some nice facilities. They do. Yeah. That's where I did, uh, there, that's the tab high graduation. Um, oh really? Yeah. That's where they do it. That's legit. There's great colleges in Virginia. I yeah. mean, like beautiful campuses. I mean, I, you could say that a lot of places, but I will say Virginia, the state has some beautiful institutions. So anyway, that's cool. Um, so look, guys, it's going to be a shorter episode today. I feel like I tease y'all with that. I say that, and then I run my mouth for like 45 minutes. We said last but, week, or episode 14 was going to be a 45, 30-minute episode. Yeah. Ended up going like an hour. Yeah, I mean, it is what it is. I mean, if hopefully you guys are enjoying the content. If you are, let us know. The best way to do that is by sharing it, uh, sharing an episode, tagging some people in it, leaving yeah. a review. Emailing and, us. Yeah, at, emailing us. Is Big it? Dog Podcast at joshwilson.dog. Yep. Um, and you know, and if we're not adding value, don't share it. We'll know that way too. Yep. So all analytics. Hopefully, um, you know, the, the all triggers point in the right direction. Oh, hey, another five star review for nice. off leash. Love to see it. Getting it done. So look, guys, what I want to talk to you about today um is it's like kind of this concept of playing your own game. And Jonathan, I'm actually excited to to bring you in on this conversation also. Um been talking with some friends lately, some staff, and you know, there a lot of people are kind of in this. I won't call it a tipping point in life, mm-hmm. but they're trying to figure out, you know, like what do I want to do? Where do I want to be? How how does the my future look right? And it's funny because there's this concept of having to have it all figured out and knowing what it is that that you're supposed to be doing at 24. Or yeah, 25 or oh my gosh, I'm 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 going to be 30 and my friends are doing this, my my cousins are doing this and I'm doing this. Right? And for me, how I'm wired, it, I don't really care what anybody else is is doing, right? Now, I, it wasn't always that way. There was plenty of time early on early mid 20s or keeping up with the Joneses as they say and and comparing and stuff. But, you know, I know people in their forties, fifties that still, you know, operate that way. And maybe they just go to a job that they they don't necessarily enjoy, but Hey, I went to school. I got me a job. I get paid every two weeks. I pay my bills and every day it's like, what? Like groundhog day. Right. And, um, that's the norm. Yeah. That that's the norm. That's what's taught kind of in school, mm-hmm. right? Like, you, yeah, what do you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Okay. Well, let's, let's kind of, let's kind of dial those aspirations back a little bit and let's get you more in alignment with the norm. Yeah. Right. And the thing that's funny to me is part of that norm. If you want to talk about the norm and like, my goal is to, to, to go the route of the norm. The norm is also most people don't have, more than a grand in the bank in savings. Yeah, exactly. Most people don't have, they might have credit, but none of it's available for use in case of an emergency. Yeah. And I mean, I'm a rapper. I don't know my credit score. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I I don't know it either. I I mean, probably probably something we should work on. Uh, yeah, I, I'll help you. I'll talk to you. I'll get you with the guy. Um, shit. <laughs> but like, it, you know, people get so hung up on it's like the norm and what everybody else is doing. And there's this anxiety and this stress by not doing it also. Or there is the norm that's taught to us from school or from 
our parents, because it's all our parents were ever taught, right? And nobody ever talks about anything that's maybe an alternative. Mm -hmm. And so when you start learning about some things that you can maybe do differently and make a life out of and um, follow giftings and passions, your music, Mm -hmm. dogs, right? Um, Making t-shirts and selling them on the gram. Like, I mean, it could be anything. When you start to like verbalize and communicate these thoughts and these ideas and these plans that are outside of the norm, what happens? I mean, you usually get some backlash or honestly not even backlash, just people like doubters and people who don't consciously doubt you to your face. They'll do it like in other circles. Yeah. Yeah. And the support we would say would be lacking. Yeah, for sure. The understanding for sure is lacking. Mm -hmm. And it isn't, oh man, that's a dope idea. I'm excited to get behind you. Like, how can I support you? How can I encourage you? It's all the reasons why you shouldn't do that thing. Yeah. Because that's not what people do. But my thing is if I do what everybody does, how do your results end up being different than what everybody else has? Exactly. And this ain't a money talk. This isn't a success talk. This isn't a uh, easy road, difficult road talk. This is a being comfortable and understanding what you want out of life. Because until that switch kind of flips and you understand that you're the only one who controls that, you're the only one who has any say in your life. You know, your your parents, sure, yeah, they invest in you, hopefully. You know, they invest in you and they encourage you and they cared for you and they got you that out the house and all those things. And hopefully you want to wish that people still have a supportive family unit, but not everybody does. But whether they do or they don't, at the end of the day, your choice or your life is your choice. And that path that you want to go on, it's no one else's burden to carry. It's no one else's path to walk, you know, but your own. But everybody seems to have an opinion on it and wants Mm -hmm. to try to keep you from doing the different things, right? Yeah, and I think that that comes as a result of not only just the norm that you're kind of taught via nurture, like within your immediate family and social circles, but the norm that you're taught via social media. I mean, we talked about it in episode 12 about how everybody presents a certain image on social media. And I know in my experience, just everybody graduating from college, you don't see the people who are still sitting at home. Like I don't have a job. I'm struggling to find a job. I majored in English like Jonathan and I'm struggling. (laughs) Um, you see the people who are posting vacations and going to brunches and they have the money to do things. They're living by themselves. Like I had to learn consciously that there is no person that graduated from a four year university that is immediately able to afford an apartment in New York or DC or LA without some sort of family help. Yeah. There's assistance. That assistance might be an 800 square foot apartment with eight roommates. That assistance may be a family who is uber supportive and has the financial means to, to get you started and going. Um, that assistance may be, they may be still carrying massive amounts of debt Mm -hmm. to fund the dream to try to get that opportunity and then try to catch up on it. Like it could be a lot of things, but the reality is most people don't have any of those things. Yeah, most people just aren't it's willing to show the, the, the route that they had to take or the help that they had. And that's why yeah. social media, in my mind, is so dangerous because yeah. that norm is really defined by the best image of what people put out there. And yeah. that's not always true. I know a lot of For people sure. making a lot of like decent money out of college yeah. and they hate their jobs. I was talking to um, a friend of mine the other day, somebody I really, really care about, and they're struggling with some stuff, trying to make some decisions you know, on life and, and directions they want to go. And they've got a lot of different people feeding into them. But not necessarily a lot of people, in my opinion, and it's just my opinion, but like supporting them. And I think in that conversation with them, it kind of spurred like, oh, man, I'm going to talk about this on the podcast a little bit because I think a lot of people can relate. You know, when, when you're struggling with decisions in life, particularly like big decisions in life, um, or maybe not in decisions, you're, you've, you've taken a turn and gone down a path that isn't necessarily that, that winning path, right? And we've all, we've all been there and we've done that and we had to battle through things and work through things. 
But what happens is I feel like when, when huge life decisions uh, approach people, um, anxiety increases, depression increases, um, vulnerability increases and nerves and, and, and all of these things, uh, erratic behavior increases chaos in your life increases. All these things are going on because there's this big, scary thing that we're unwilling to deal with or to push through. And so what do we end up doing? We find something that immediately takes our mind away from it, right? Mm -hmm. And it'll just, okay, I feel better right now. I don't have to deal with it. Some people it's doing something, you know, extreme, you know, bungee jumping off, bungee jumping, bungee jumping, you know, uh, you know, off a building, uh, skydiving, um, substance abuse, right? Like, uh, just freaking sex, you know, alcohol, it it could be anything, a momentary fix, right? As you're, and usually those bad decisions are made at like that biggest pressure point, right? It's like, I just got to fix it. And so this decision's made and now it feels better. Well, then there's tomorrow. Then there's a week from now. And the problem, the the dissatisfaction with where you're at in life, where you're at professionally, where you're at relationally, where is still there. And the habit is when that pressure builds back up and that anxiety and that tension, let me go to that quick release. It's never good for me, but it's good for now. But then a day later, a week later, what's building back up that pressure? And we talked about this on another episode. Um, I think it was building planes. Yeah. So many people get to the edge and look at the view and enjoy it from afar and all that. But the magic is on, is on the other side, right? You know, to take that last step, you know, to the unknown and, and work it out. And I'm having this conversation with a friend of mine. And I was like, at that point where you feel like you break, that's where it fig- that's where the clarity comes from that's where you figure it out and the reason it's a cycle of repeated failure or frustration or anxiety is because every time you get to that point breaking scares the hell out of us mm-hmm. let me just go to the thing that makes me feel good and then the cycle repeats and it's like we're here we're here we're here setback here we're here we're here setback but we can't even see that it's a setback because everything else causes me anxiety everything else causes me depression everything else causes me pain everything else makes me feel like i'm not doing enough everything makes me feel less worthy but this makes me feel good right now but the next week it's all back again and so i really believe it's at that point of breaking where the clarity comes and it's like ah oh, This is what I'm really about. It's at that point of breaking where it comes. These are the relationships of people that are really for me, Mm -hmm. not just around me. This is at that breaking point where it's like, man, I I really thought I was going to be a park ranger, (laughs) ranger Rick my whole life. Yeah. Now I ended up in real estate and I've lost everything what am I really doing? Yeah. What am I passionate about? What do I want? You know what I mean? Yeah. And but sure. if, if you always bail right before the breaking point for temporary comfort, you never find out where you're supposed to be. Yeah. And I mean, something that definitely happened with me that I had to come back from that breaking point was when I lost um, the opportunity to join the media studies program at UVA. Cause I was just, messing around, not going to some classes, ended up with a GPA slightly lower than what they were looking for to be in the program. And my whole goal going to UVA was I'm going to join the media studies program. I'm going to work with professors who have been in media, then I'm going to be a journalist. Yeah. Well, around my second year in school, I kind of became disillusioned with the news um, and journalism as a whole um, and slacked off, didn't make the program. And I reached that breaking point of like, okay, I've paid this much money for school. Well, my parents have paid this much money for school. And I'm going through two years of education. And now I have no idea what path I want to take. Yeah, I'm 
I don't have a major. I don't have a career idea because now I don't have this. I can't get a job to right. even start it. But now three years later, I'm here doing something relatively similar to what I was learning. Sure. So I think that reaching that breaking point and finding clarity within all of the chaos yeah. um, definitely comes about at a certain point, but it's difficult to tell people that you care about that. Hey, you got to reach rock bottom first. For for sure. Like, absolutely. And you know, we won't jump into a bunch of details. I'm not gonna put you on the spot and stuff, but during that process, there were some challenges oh, that yeah, you dealt sure. with and, and worked through. And, and, the, and the challenges don't <laughs> just end like, correct. And I mean, these are all just opinions and we wish the best for our audience, but I feel like it's naive of us to say like, hey, that breaking point that you reach is going to be your only breaking point. Then you receive this ultimate clarity. Nope, there's going to be there's going to be a lot more. But what comes of the breaking point, though, is power. Mm -hmm. That's where your power is at, because everybody bails to what feels good in the moment because they don't think they can actually survive the breaking yeah, they don't think they can overcome whatever the roadblock is, mm-hmm. and the truth of it. And this does this is not opinion. This is fact because I've seen it time and time and time again with people. Your power will come from being broken, because you will realize what you think breaks you and ends you that is unrecoverable. Mm-hmm. It just makes you stronger. Yeah, you you and then you start to see yourself differently, and you start to realize all these people's opinions I was worried about and concerned with for so long about my life mean nothing because there's this unit of people that I'm at my worst right now and they're investing in me. They're picking me up. They're brushing me off. They're encouraging me regardless of myself in spite of myself. They're here for me. Now, Their opinions, in my opinion, about what you should be doing and how you should be doing are as worthless as the people who were doubting you and, and, and pressing. Like, you've got to make these decisions for yourself. But as you break and as you get more confident, that clarity comes about in that process. And once you are 100% comfortable with knowing that you're the one making those decisions, anxiety drops. Yeah. Doesn't mean everything's easy. But you realize that literally every place that you're at is 100% a reflection of a decision you made. Mm -hmm. And that realization isn't only power, like the power to be able to get out of certain circumstances in the future. It's also perception because you need to know when you're you're approaching that breaking point, when you're in that breaking point and how to come out of it. Because I feel like so many of us are willing to recognize it to ourselves. But when we reach out, like the sequoia trees we reach out for help to our network and then it's like we don't even really realize how deep in the hole we were yeah for sure and and that's when you the real ones right that's when you find out like who's really for you who's really with you who's who (laughs) i call it who's who's also who's equally willing to stand at the bus stop with me tomorrow morning as they are to jump in the car, you know, and go to the steak dinner tonight. Mm -hmm. You know, if all that changed, the same person sitting next to me on the bus at the, sitting at the bench with me, that's who I want riding with me. Yeah. Cause it doesn't matter. None of that stuff matters. If there's good shit along the way, cool. If there's bumps along the way, cool. I'm for you. You're for me. And that we spend too much time giving, uh, energy and um influence the people who are not for you they're just not for you and now you're hemmed up trying to make a decision about your life because the person you went to school with that you haven't talked to in nine years yeah is you know chief technology officer of some startup that may be damn bankrupt in three months but their title looks cool or they're doing this and that and we discredit all the things we've already accomplished along the way. We never give ourselves enough credit for what we've accomplished because we're always comparing it to everybody else's game. Yeah. I mean, you got to play your own damn game. In my eyes, comparison is the death of progress because when you're trying, when you're trying to grow, if you're constantly comparing yourself to somebody who might be a little bit further ahead than you, you might think, okay, well, this is the furthest that I can go. Right. And I mean, it goes, 
it goes back even to like even simpler roots. Like when we were all just in school, middle school, high school, how many moments felt like they were the biggest, like they were going to define your yes. life. Yes. And then we're here six, nine, however many years later. And yeah none of it matters like you i don't remember half the people's names who i even had any issues or confrontations with in secondary school right. who cares exactly none of it none of it really matters it it doesn't and you know it it's hard in the moment mm -hmm. and it's hard for those who lack life experience to to wrap their head around that but what you think uh, this kind of people take this two ways what you think is the worst possible thing that happened to you in life it isn't, you know, yeah. and it's, and that doesn't mean something worse is going to happen, but you know, 2008 real estate market turns, we lose everything bankrupt, went from balling to having to move in with my mom, mm -hmm. me, Devin and the kids for like a year, you know, just so we could figure stuff out and get it back together. I was in a bad way, bro. Like for me, I was done. I was so embarrassed. I was so this and that. I mean, it was, I mean, it was bad. Yeah. I couldn't imagine. I'd never taken an L though in my life. You know, mom, mom, I mean, they, you know, you can kill it. You can do whatever. All this. I was so confident. I didn't know how to take an L. Yeah. And life gave me a capital bold, like 84 font size L. Mm -hmm. And that stung. Yeah. I didn't know how to deal with it. I mean, people and people respond to those situations differently. I mean, look at where you are now. You took that L and you feel informed and you've grown right. past yes. that. But then there's people that can't. The biggest example to yeah. me is a UFC fighter, Paulo Costa, undefeated, okay. yeah, sixteen and zero middleweight, Brazilian, crazy, one of the craziest fighters on the roster. Yeah, he goes for a title fight against Israel Adesanya, style bender, who you okay. might have seen. Yep, he gets knocked out within the first like ten minutes. He hasn't fought in a year now. Yeah. And nobody really has heard from him. He's dropped out of a couple of fights and people are thinking that he's done because yeah. he took this one big momentous L and he's never lost before. Right. Now he might be done. He wasn't built to come back from that. Yeah. You know, or maybe, you know, it's just going to take him a little longer, you know, but and nobody knows though, because like, where is this dude? Yeah. What's going on? And for me, I disappeared for a hot minute because I was so embarrassed. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. I did not handle so many things right during that time. I didn't. I jacked up relationships. I, you know, it, there were a lot of, there were trust issues. Like yeah. I did not know. I was not equipped to deal with the pain and the losses uh, uh, during that time. And um, it, it just was a mess. And I had to take the time to figure out and like that breaking and I've had plenty of L's since then. And God willing, I'll have plenty more as we go. Because I feel, you know, it, ooh, the Chris Stapleton has a line in a song. And he says, um, no one wins who's afraid of losing. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, I'm not afraid of losing. That does not, I do not have fear in that. And I think that's why we do have some of the success that we have. Because I'm willing to take chances that others may not be. Um, but... I think there's so much wisdom in that line. Nobody wins who's afraid of losing. Because if, if you're afraid of losing, you're unwilling to play the game, mm -hmm. whatever that is. For my life, for my family's life, Devin and I make strategic decisions on what we want to do for our lives. We were talking this morning about an investment opportunity in something and uh, whether we thought it would be a good fit for us to do, whether there was interest in doing it or not. And, you know, I, I think we're going to pull the trigger on it. Mm -hmm. It's an area we've never dabbled in it would be passive but we're like hey this could be kind of a cool thing and we're gonna see at the end of the day though we're 100 percent comfortable knowing that that investment may lose 100 mm -hmm. and so do we put our livelihood into it no <laughs> no that means if it wins do i hit you know a massive home run no but if it tanks i'm also not putting myself in jeopardy yeah. You know, or my family. So you got to determine. So I'm not scared of the L, but like you have to manage it, right? You have to manage the game and we manage it for ourselves. I've got friends who, if I discuss this with, bro, don't do that. It's the dumbest thing on the planet. Okay. I got friends who I had discussed it with who would be like, I'm putting every penny I have into my name in this. You got to find where you're at on that spectrum. 
Yeah. Right. You, it's, it's not one or the other because what's right for friend C and what's right for friend A doesn't mean it's right for me. Yeah. But you have to be willing, though, to block out that noise and have clarity on what you want and what your goals are. And at 42, I don't have it figured out. I'm going to continue to get my teeth kicked in. Yeah. I'm sitting here 24 years old and terrified at that. <laughs> right. And that's totally fair. You should be terrified. Life is hard as shit. It is not for the faint of heart, but you've got to be willing to do things. If you want a life that's different, you've got to be willing to do things that are different. If you want a life like everybody else, life is still going to be hard, but it's easy to figure out. Yeah, I mean, it really is a game. Just go that get can a job. Played. Yeah, pay your bills. You will. You will live. You'll die at seventy-eight years old, and you know that is one thing about the norm that is, I guess, kind of, I guess, comforting. Not really to me because I want to be different, do something different. Sure. But if you're seeking the norm. It's pretty much cut and dry. Like yeah. society will tell you what it is. Get a jo- get a job, find someone you love, have family. The playbook's there. Yeah. Because everybody plays it. Everybody plays it. And so there's not this what if. Go to work, do your job, get paid. Go home, spend 30 minutes with your family, go to sleep, yeah. get up the next morning, do it again. It, it really is the vertical go route of, <laughs> of life <laughs> strategies. It, it is. And it's so simple. But the thing that's crazy about it is it's so simple, but the, that life is still going to have problems. It is still going to be hard. There is still going to be heartbreak and devastation and loss. But you, you may not know when those things are going to take place, but they're still going to take place. But what you do know is your maximum results of those choices. Mm-hmm. And you can't live your life trying to protect yourself from the negative outcomes. They're coming anyway. Yeah. I mean, because that is life. Life is not designed for us to be easy. It is not designed for us to be cookie cutter. Society, though, tries to make it where, hey, like, hey, stay in your lane. This is what you're supposed to do. Go knock this out. You can do this for 34 years. Retire. Get your little money. Do your thing. Little money. You know, and then there's... People are like, ah, uh, my anxiety is within being in that system. Mm-hmm. You know, what, what do I need to do? There's just this turmoil. There's just this chaos. Like, that's you. That is your internal self telling you you're supposed to do something different. Yeah. If your anxiety is coming from and pressure is coming from all these people who are trying to dial you into the normal thing and it's just not natural for you, you're not supposed to be doing that. Now, that doesn't mean you just don't go get a nine to five job while you figure it out. Of course, but sure. Mm-hmm. You got responsibilities, you got bills to pay. But you got to you got to be aware to listen to yourself to know, hey, this isn't for me. Because if this is normal and I'm so unhappy and I'm so anxious and I'm depressed and I'm all these things, you're not good with yourself. Because mm-hmm. anyone who's good with themselves isn't feeling that way on a regular basis. I get anxious. I get depressed. I've learned to manage it. I have anxiety every day Mm -hmm. that I struggle with. And, you know, about a year and a half ago, two two years ago, I guess now, spent several months going to therapy, talking to a guy, you know, and working through some things I had going on. And I learned some stuff that helps me, hey, daily, where I I can manage these things and work on these things. Some days are harder than others. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, but it's like, it's not that anxiety shouldn't exist. It's not that depression, depression is just going to go away. But it was so much heavier and worse when I was trying to appease everyone else. Yeah. And I think that's something you just touched on something important because we're not trying to discount the people who deal with legitimate, like chemical deficiencies 100%. or, um, any sort of mental um, mental health issues. Sure, these are real. But it's important. It's important to acknowledge that day to day you are going to have those manic highs where you get anxious and those really low points. And yeah. there needs to be a way because I struggle with this myself. I'm not sure. a big believer in, I guess, what you would say, modern medicine and as it deals with the mind. Sure, yeah. Because I don't think that we know everything yet. And I think that finding those ways of controlling breathing. Um, 
controlling breathing, stepping outside of myself, figuring out different situations, yeah. it helps. And sure. it helps deal with the intermediate. Now, are there moments where I get too freaked out, too depressed? Yeah. But that's when other methods come in. But having those ways of dealing sure. with it yourself. Yeah. But you also have that self-awareness. Like, you know it's an issue. And Sometimes. It, sure. But think about before you were willing to acknowledge that. Before you were willing to take steps to help yourself manage and deal with it. Just like with me. Like, I can't speak for you, but for me, it would be crippling sometimes. Mm -hmm. And the majority of the time it was crippling. Because I'm stacking all these things on me that weren't for me. They weren't my responsibilities. They weren't my problems to solve. It wasn't, I was making life harder because I'm, I'm gauging my life versus uh, someone else's measurements, mm -hmm. someone else's meter, someone else's expectations. It wasn't until I got clarity on my own expectations and what I really wanted. It didn't matter what Devin wanted for me. It doesn't matter what my kids want for me. It doesn't matter what my mother wants for me. I had to get clear on what I wanted for me and what was important to me. Mm -hmm. Now you can manage it. Not perfectly. <laughs> Nobody's perfect, right? And like you said, their mental health is a crazy thing. Literally, right? Like yeah, it's and it's never literally. black and white. And it is not. Everybody, it's different and. Um, you know, and, and I, I would take this quick moment to say, it, therapy <laughs> is an important thing. Like mm -hmm. you, to the, to the men listening right now, like people see me and they're like, Josh, big bearded dude, dogs, big truck, man's, man's man, whatever, whatever. Yeah. I sat on the couch, fellas. I had the conversations because I was fucking up. Yeah. I was not, I was, I was not being a great dad. I was not being a great husband. I was not being a great boss. Oh, trust me. You know? I'm, I'm Tony Soprano without all the mafia <laughs> stuff. I'm just on a couch. I, complaining. Right. Like it's, it, you think you're a man, you want to be the man, man figures out how to handle their shit mm -hmm. and going and talking to somebody about hurts and struggles and pains that does not diminish your ability to be to be strong, to, to lead. Yeah. Um, and that was, that was hard for me. I did not always feel that way or understand it. But again, that breaking, right. I kept having that repeated process where I was like getting to the verge. Where I'm like, ah, and then I'd go to something immediate that would make me feel better, but it never fixed the problem. And then finally it was like, no, something's got to give. Mm -hmm. And Devin's like, Hey, have you thought about it? Maybe you do this. When friends of mine were like, hey, have you talked to anybody? Mm -hmm. I'm like, what do you mean? I ain't going to lay in a damn couch. I ain't going to talk to a shrink. Look, my dude had the, like the bowl of mints. Like, you know, they have at WEC, mm -hmm. right? Like the mints. I cannot tell you how many of those damn mints I crushed. I can't remember exactly what my copay was, but I know I got it tenfold in mints. I was yeah. so nervous the first couple sessions, and I'm just like popping popping these mints. He probably thought I was legit off because it was such a manic behavior, mm -hmm. but it was nervousness. But the first couple of times were difficult, but you got to be receptive. You got, you got to be open to these things. And, and I, I, I know this took a little bit of a turn from where we started. No, I mean, I think, but it I, I think it, it parallels very well Yeah, is because when you're struggling at these points, and if it's a recurring theme in your life, clearly there's a, a, a disconnect in your ability to, to, to handle it yourself. Yeah, and I think that our mental health is a direct result of how we view reality and societal yes. norms, family norms, yeah. economic norms definitely play into how we perceive reality. Yeah. So as we pass the 30 minute mark, I do yeah. have a question Please. for you. It, um, so we started off this episode talking about how you are counseling somebody yeah. on, I guess, life, what they want to do yeah. um, and the decisions that they can make. Being in that role, how would you counsel somebody who is looking to counsel somebody else and give them that advice. Because I think that it's 
important to note that sometimes as people who care for others, we don't always want to give them advice because we're worried it could be taken the wrong way. It could sure. be misconstrued. They could apply it and their life could go completely backwards. And yeah we feel somewhat responsible. So how would you recommend navigating that difficult subject? So one, that's a really great question. Um, clearly I don't mind hearing my own voice. (laughs) Um, but I think in those situations, listening is really, really key. Um, ask questions that prompt the conversation to continue. Mm -hmm. Don't necessarily respond with answers. People will say and talk and ask very small, easy questions that prompt them to move forward and go just a little bit deeper in these things. And because a lot of times in these situations, people can figure it out themselves. Like there's, there's, there's our little, there's our personalities that we have. And there's the one who's like, no, don't vocalize that. You will, you will show vulnerability you will show show weakness they may not understand right but then there's the other part it's like man, talk to somebody talk to somebody you care about like express these feelings um and a lot of times when you just verbalize like it's spoken and you hear it this happened for me in therapy a lot i would say things i would hear it i have no clue what the therapist said back to me because when i heard it I knew what I needed to do about it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you just need to say it out loud. But if you don't verbalize things, now it's in your head. And no one will talk more shit on you than yourself. Like, no one is a bigger hater on you than yourself. And even if you're like, man, you don't see the stuff people say to me online. You don't see the emails I get, Josh. I don't care. (laughs) I don't care. You talk more shit on yourself than anybody else. And it may not be more often but it's more powerful than what anybody else can say. So when that self doubt creeps in, it's just beating you up. It's just beating you up, but you verbalize it. You hear it in a different way. And you're like, well, if this was a friend saying this to me, this is how I would address it with them. And you're like, why the hell did I not do that myself? Yeah. Right. And so give those little promptings that get people to go further. Acknowledge that you hear, that you're hearing them, mm-hmm. all right? And know that your job is not to fix them. Yeah. It's not to fix them. It's just, if they're asking for your opinion, give the opinion. If they're not asking for the opinion, don't. Yeah. Just sure. listen, because it's not your job to fix them. But if you're for them, it's your job to be for them. Exactly. I was going to say to add on to that, it's really important to just be unequivocally for whoever is asking you for help. Yeah. Because you don't have to be for an idea. You don't have to be for a plan that they have. Yeah. You don't have to be for anybody else around them. But if they're asking you for support and you genuinely care about them, being unequivocally there for them and wanting the best for them is 100% the way to go. Because, again, it's their path. It's their game to play. It's their moves to make. Mm-hmm. Agree or disagree, at the end of the day, it does not impact your game. It does not impact your path. So who the hell are you? Who the hell am I? to tell people that that they shouldn't. Now, if I have direct experience and they're asking for my direct feedback, I have a responsibility to tell them my experience. And I have a responsibility to be honest with them about that. But I do not have a responsibility to sway them. Exactly. But where we are today and where we're trying to get is 100% built on <laughs> failure. <laughs> Failure time and time again. Yeah. You know, and, and luckily, you know, I would have said from early on professionally that I could care less what anybody thought or said. It wasn't true. Every decision I made was based on the response I would get of what everybody's thoughts would be or perception of me. Now, I really truly don't care, you know, other people's thoughts and feelings on it, whether it's, you know, the, the business or, or things like that. Um, you know, and so it's easier to make those decisions that are unpopular, that are uncommon, that seem to make no sense to everybody else. Cause I'm comfortable with where I know the direction I'm going. Mm-hmm. And I think that comes back to, it's like play 
the game. Play your game. Make decisions for your game plan. And stick to it. When you realize that you are the only one who determines your outcomes, there's no limits. There's no limits. Nothing's impossible. It just 100% comes down to the decisions that you choose to make for you. And until you're comfortable and confident in taking those, the anxiety, the depression, the stressors, the chaos in life, all that stays the same. Guys, I hope this is helpful for somebody. If you feel like you know somebody needs to hear it, share it. Uh, we'd love if you could leave a review for us, Spotify, iTunes. Um, you know, we appreciate you guys tuning in on different platforms. We appreciate the the six of you watching on YouTube each week. We're, we're, we're doing better than that. Yeah, there's, but, there's uh, like a four, solid 40 people. Solid, but. solid numbers. Getting better every week. So we appreciate you guys and um, can't wait to, to be with you all next week. Take us out, Jonathan. <laughs>